how he grew these people in the cave. First Samuel, amen, and I'm going to start off with there again. First Samuel chapter 22, just a reminder, because we've been talking about, I decided to change this called Raising Warriors in a Cave or something. So, First uh, Samuel 22, so David departed there and escaped to the cave of Abdullah, and when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was distressed, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. Now, we talked about that one day. Amen. Discontented. That means somebody you can't make content. There's nothing you can do to make them happy. That's tough to get those people around you. And, 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 and they gathered to him. And they became, he became captain over them. He became captain over them. Now, we went from there to 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. These are the mighty men of David amen these are the mighty men you'll see later on that whole chapter in second samuel 23 8 it'll go through about these mighty men of david one after another the great things that they did amen struck the philistine verse 10 until his hand was weary there was such powerful things happened yeah amen mighty men but let me go through i want to talk today about 12 keys to opening the door to power 12 keys to open in the door to power. I'm going to start off in Luke chapter 3. 12 keys to open in the door to power. Because I was always wondering what happened in there. But these are things that I saw Jesus that I believe are 12 keys we can see with Jesus about bringing people, amen, into empowering them, amen. Luke Chapter 3, I'm looking for all the elements of what it takes to empower people. I talk to the friends around you, ask them, what about this? What about this? It's, it's, it's amazing what people don't know and how they're not empowered. Uh, Luke chapter 3, and I'm going to start off with verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized while he was praying. Heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It was amazing. Jesus did everything. Even when John the Baptist came to, to baptize, and Jesus said, It's fitting for you to baptize me so that I can fulfill all righteousness. Now, I wrote down here, I want to write down here, number one, that's a key to opening the door to power. I'm going to write down here, number one. Amen. Number one, a new baptism. Amen. A new baptism. Amen. Uh, yeah. A new baptism. Who's with me? Is that right? What? You know... Somebody come and write it, because, hallelujah. This? Okay. All right. A new... <laughs> a new baptism, amen? What I'm talking about is we need... I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 10... And verse 2, because it's very important, Jesus was baptized with water and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon Jesus the way he's going to come upon us. Jesus had nothing to be refined, who's with me. He was pure and holy, so it came on him gentle like a dove. And he now moved from the order of Aaron to the order of Melchizedek at that moment. So he was totally changed at that specific moment. We're talking about a new baptism. We're talking about an absolute transition from the, from the Aaronic order to the Melchizedek order. We're talking about, now watch this says, it says, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 2. And it says, and they were all baptized in a Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual drink and they all drank the same spiritual drink. And they, for they were drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. They were all baptized in a Moses and the cloud. Once again... When David was in the cave, amen, they made him their captain. Hallelujah. 
I totally, and then we see they were baptized into what? The cloud. We know the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the sea, the Red Sea divided. Amen. This is the fact of identity, not just with leadership, but the identity with Christ. So many times what happens is when we want to grow something or connect with something or lead, we have to also be connected to the vision, amen, of the leader, as well, who's with me, as the vision of Christ. They should be synonymous, but we have to trust a man to lead. The, I totally believe in the plurality of ministry. Plurality of ministry is when they got the ark and they were getting ready to go through the Jordan River. Eight men carried the Ark of the Covenant. And those eight priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant, and the minute they put their foot in the water, the Jordan River divided, rolled all the way back, and they went into the Promised Land. And that was plurality. But who instructed the eight men to go ahead? Joshua. Amen. So as much as we like for everybody to be the leader, which is what we want, that's what we want. It does, yeah, we, we don't want to take, you understand, we don't want to take away from what I call plurality of ministry. That means I totally believe everybody's called to signs and wonders. I totally believe everybody's called to lead. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That is the truth. Yeah. And David had mighty men. And I'm sure David expected all of them to lead. Just like when um, they crossed the, 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 you have to understand, you see, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, it was one man lift up his rod. And the Red Sea divided. But when they entered into the promised land and the fullness of what God had done, it took eight people and one man. You remember their names means God is light. God is strength. God is mighty. God is glorious. God is illumination. One of their names means God is revelation. All these carried the ark. But yet there was still somebody connected to that group called a set man, somebody called Joshua. All through history, that's why, that's why when David's mighty men moved from where they were, they chose to make David their captain. They chose to make David their captain. Doesn't make, it doesn't make it that David, and you know David didn't act like he was any better than them. He did not try to act like he was any better than them. So I understand plurality, but what I'm trying to say is they were baptized into a new baptism. I know this is strategic. This is a doorway to power because when we talk about number one, I'm talking about 12 keys. Amen to a doorway, amen, to power. Hallelujah. I thank God, amen, for the spiritual leaders in my life. I thank God for the people who imparted me something. I thank God, like Paul says, I long to impart to you some spiritual gift. I thank God for the people who came in my life who's with me, and I knew after they prayed for me, something drastically changed. So when we talk about a new baptism, we're talking about being baptized. Jesus had the Spirit of God come upon him. Now, Jesus had nobody. All he had was the Father. This is my beloved Son, who's with me, in whom I am well pleased. Keep in mind now, some people go, well, Brother Warren, I just don't believe in uh, spiritual fathers and those kind of things. You know, I just, you know, don't call anybody on earth. No, you're misinterpreting Scripture because that verse says, doesn't just say don't call anybody on earth father. It says don't call anybody rabbi, teacher. So that means we're just going to run around and never give a title to anybody. That's not what it's saying. Hallelujah. Because the same verse that says, don't call anybody father, he said, don't call anybody rabbi, don't call anybody teacher. So you're going to go to your teacher and say, I can't call you teacher because the Bible says, I can't, you know, I can't, you know. Huh? No, no, that's not what he's talking about. You have to look at the scripture context very carefully because many times Paul represented, he said you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. Amen. In the same way Paul used things like he would say, to Timothy, my son, to Titus, my son. So there's nothing wrong with endearment. The idea of a leader is to represent the heartbeat of the father. Amen. Is to represent the nature of the father. Hallelujah. To represent that nature. That is a very powerful nature because then what happens is when we pray for people, they actually believe, if they respect it on you, they believe there's something you can impart. Like Paul says in Romans 1.11, I long to impart to you some spiritual gift that you may, what? Grow thereby. Amen. So a new baptism is a powerful key. Amen. You know, this is something that's very, very important when we want to step into what God has for us. And I understand the idea there with the new baptism is also the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We have to get everyone empowered amen 
I'm going to say that, let me write it down, that everyone that we disciple, everyone we lead, must be empowered, who's with me? Amen. By the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who's with me? They must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The second thing that's important that I want to go through is I want to keep, look at, look at Luke chapter 4. I want you to see this. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, I love this. I was doing this actually in Amplified. Let me go here. Because today I'm marked, I was reading this, and I love this in Amplified. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Amen. Chapter 4. When Jesus full, I like this, this is Amplified. When Jesus full and controlled by the Holy Spirit returned from Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit for during 40 days in the desert where he was tempted, tried, tested exceedingly by the devil, he ate nothing during those days, and when they're complete, he was hungry. Amen. Hallelujah. I thought this was really powerful because, amen, be led by the Spirit to the wilderness to face the enemy of your future. Let me write this down. Number two, amen, be led. I'm just going to put it this way real short. Be led by the Spirit to do what? To face the enemy. Amen. To get to the place of power, what did Jesus have to do? He had to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness to face the enemy. Let me include this word, the, the enemy of your future. Oh, some people say, well, I got an enemy. No, 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 no. You're going to have an enemy tomorrow. You're going to have an enemy the next day. For you to step into power, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit to face the enemy of your future. This is, I'm talking about keys to the doorway to power. You have to be led to face the enemy of your future. I thought about this. For 40 days he fasted. Amen. I love this because, and it says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Let me say that this way. I love this because... Amen. He says, tell the stone we come bread. And Jesus answered him and said, written, man shall not live by bread alone. I want to write down here. Yeah. Uh, let me write this down. Number three. Number three. Overcome your temptation. Who's with me? Overcome your temptation. What do you mean? I'm talking about every material, material needs. Amen. Overcome temptation. I remember when me and Kayla were going back to Africa one time, we decided to take everything we have and give it away. Then after we came back another time, we left and went back to Africa. We decided to take everything we had and get away. I remember one time we had a garage sale in our yard and we put everything out in the front. And people were coming by because it was a neighborhood garage sale. Everybody around the circle was having a garage sale. We put all our stuff out in the driveway, and we put on free. And the neighbors thought we were crazy. I said, don't worry, I'm going to get a whole lot more than you out of this old thing than you trying to sell it for 10 bucks because I'm going to sow it, and I'll get a harvest. You see, you've got to overcome the limitation of material needs. If you're going to step into power, you've got to, because here Jesus was hungry. He needed something. I need food. I need food. I need food. Uh, who's with me? He was hungry. And the devil said to him, no, if you turn this, you know, you know, I mean, the devil started tempting him. He has this beautiful pie. He has this. You've got to eat this. You, you won't make it if you don't have that. Or who's with me? It can be food. It can be anything. But you have to overcome temptation. Amen. You have to overcome temptation. Amen. The kingdom is not based on need. Amen. All your giving must be righteous and done in God. Hallelujah. It's very important. We've talked about this before. Having the nature of a giver. One of the biggest things that learn to overcome is being a giver, not being selfish. Amen. It can be anything, any kind of deal. Amen. Setting God first. One of the things to overcome your temptation is learn to set God first. Make God first. That's a, that's a major thing. Let me put, I'm going to put this under here as well. 
set God first. I'll never forget that pastor. I went to preach with this pastor lady in South Africa, uh, well, her and her husband, and I noticed when I walked out of the church, about 80% of the church were out in the parking lot smoking cigarettes, and I was thinking to myself, something's going on here. We've got to work on a problem. So I thought to myself, mm, I've got to figure something. So, I, so the Lord gave me a word. It was a strange word. I looked at the pastor's wife, and I said, you love Jesus with all your heart. I said, when you get up in the morning, you pray and read your Bible every morning, you know? And she said, yes, I do. And then I looked at her like this. I said, but you know what? The Lord told me that's not the first thing you do. Of course you love him. But he said the first thing you do when you make up in the morning is you light the cigarette. And the last thing you do before you go to bed is you light the cigarette. I know you love God, but I said, to her, why don't you change the order? So I encouraged her. I said, now when you wake up in the morning, the first thing I want you to do. She, she would say, well, she said, I grab my coffee and I get my cigarettes. And then I go sit out there and smoke. And then I, after that, I spend time reading my Bible and praying. I said, no, no. I said, let's change the order. You go out, spend time praying, reading your Bible, and loving God. Then when you finish that, see if you can light your cigarette. <laughs> you see, there wasn't, I wasn't condemning her. I was just trying to show, seek, set God, what? First. And a lot of times what happens is we're trying to get past certain habits to come in the power of God. But a lot of it's got to do with overcoming your temptations. For some people, it's pornography. For some people, it's all kinds of things. I know ministers who can't go to bed on a Saturday night, even before they preach the sermon Sunday morning, they sit and watch pornography for hours. I had to pray for hundreds of, remember when I was in Morris Rillis Conference, in, when Ed Cole spoke, I remember praying for this one pastor at a church of 4,000 people in California. I went down there to the furnace, praying for him, I said, what's wrong? He said, every night when I want to study on a Saturday night for my sermon, he said, I go to the internet to look up my notes, and before I know it, I'm just watching pornography for several hours, and then when I get up to preach the next morning, I'm struggling. So of course he's not going to have power. He might have a message. But he won't have power because you have to have a new baptism. You have to be led to face, face the enemy of your future. Overcome your temptation. Set God first. Somebody said, no, no, no. Okay, ready? Let's keep leading. And the devil said to him, I will give you all. Look at verse 5. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Whew. I like to say some of these temptations are spirit, soul, and body. One seemed to apply to the flesh. One seemed to apply to identify. If you be the son of God, throw yourself down. Do you know who you are? The other one was, you're hungry in the flesh. I'll may turn these stones into bread. Another one is, he took him up on this pinnacle, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's actually almost supernatural. There's something spiritual about that. How can I take you up on a mountain and make you see all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time? Mm -hmm. how, how am I going to do that even if I'm the devil? There's something supernatural, and that's what I call the temptation of the Spirit. So I like to say sometimes these temptations are the temptation of the, of the, the soul, the temptation of the flesh, and the temptation of the Spirit. I know for some people are listening, it's okay, you'll, you'll get it, amen. But he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and this one is overcome the temptation of dominion and glory. <laughs> Let me write this down. <laughs> Four. Overcome the temptation of dominion and glory. Amen. Overcome the temptations of dominion and glory. You say, what are you talking about? Some people, they don't. They get so caught up. I've seen this in Africa. Before you know it, the pastor is almost like an idol. He's so caught up with titles. He thinks he's so much. Hallelujah. This is not, this is not godly. You see what happens is you've got to overcome the temptation of dominion and glory. I'm not saying that God, what is man that you have mindful of him, that you've crowned him with honor and glory and gave him dominion over all the works he hands? I understand that Psalms 8.5 says, what is man that you are mindful of him, that you've crowned him with honor and glory and gave him dominion over all the works? No, this did not go at all. So there's no way we have this again. What? I don't know. I do, but I don't know how that happened. I pushed the button. And, okay. Well, I lost one before. I just don't want to lose. Amen? <laughs> it's 
takes more than that. Hallelujah. <laughs> it just means so much to me that things are done. Amen. That people can hear what we're saying. Because I, I don't want to waste words or anything. Hallelujah. Uh, so overcome the temptation of glory and dominion. Amen. Um. Let me carry on a little further. And Jesus came to him and said, You shall worship the Lord God only, and him shall he serve. Verse 9. And he led him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. Amen. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he led him up on an opportune time. Amen. Overcome the temptation. Amen. This is very important because watch what Jesus did here. Overcome the temptation of manipulating time to benefit you. Overcome the temptation of manipulating time. Amen. I'm just going to say number five, manipulating time to benefit you. It's amazing how people cannot wait for God to do certain things sometimes. They're always trying to make it happen for themselves. They step out of timing, amen, and they don't know how to, to understand the purpose of their calling. When you don't understand the purpose of your calling or the timing of your calling, it's very easy to step out of the timing of the calling, trying to make it rush and happen faster than it's supposed to happen. Some people can't step into their place of power because they try to rush their calling, amen. And they try to rush what God has called them to do. They almost try to manipulate time to benefit themselves. Amen. That means if the pastor doesn't do this this fast, or if I don't get promoted, or if, if it just don't happen like this, or if, you know, they get to a church and they want to be like second in command in two months, who's with me? You understand? Or now they're the prophet of the church and they've only been there two weeks. Or this happens to people. It's like, you know, they want to be there and they're going to be on the worship team the second day they're there. And you know what I'm saying? It's like they're almost trying to manipulate time to benefit you. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. It's like I've seen people come and then they start trying to manipulate things in the environment to get them where they need to be or position them where they want to be or try and make it sound like they've been buddy buddies with you for 50 years and they just met you. Hallelujah. And you don't have, don't, don't get caught up with the temptation to try and manipulate time to benefit you. It's not going to, it, the, the importations grow. Anointing grows when we're in a place. Amen? Amen? God knows. God will see you. God will recognize you at the right time, at the right place. Hallelujah. Amen, Amen Warren. You're saying a whole lot. Hallelujah. Number six, <laughs> number six, amen, number six, amen, number six, command the enemy to leave you. And it's amazing how people don't take the authority to take care of the devil. They want to step into power, but they don't know how to get the devil out of the way. It's like, I want to go into this place of power, but five demons are standing in front of me. And it's like thinking they can go there without taking care of those demons. It's kind of like what, that situation happened in Europe one time when I was praying for that lady. And she started talking back to me in English. Remember the French girl? And she was like, I ain't going to come out. And I was like, that sounds like a Texas accent. I turned to one of the people and said, can she speak French? No. I said, you fail, spirit. It was, she was involved with what, all kinds of sexual you know, relationships. And she must have gone to America before, the way I understand it. She went to America one time, had sex with several men, who knows, whatever. And it was a spirit of, a, what do you call it, where you run around having sex with everybody, amen? Adultery, fornication, whatever. And I was commanding that spirit to come out of her. And I'll never forget the pastor was standing there by me. And she turned back and she like turned back and said, 
well, you're doing the same thing. And the pastor ran like, and he went back to the back church. And he just stood there. He froze. He waited till the whole service over and never said one word. <laughs> I was like, how can you command the enemy to leave you? Hallelujah. No, I want to get the devil out of you, but I can't get it out of myself. <laughs> oh, God, help us. And he'll let me carry on. This is Luke chapter 4. Let's carry on. Ready? Where we at? <clears throat> Verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. <clears throat> How do you like that? He returned in the what? The power of the Spirit. Now, he has given us <clears throat> a prototype, an example, a type of what he went through to show us how to go through there. It would be like whatever David went through in the cave, his men are going to pick it up. <clears throat> his strengths, his weaknesses, whatever he's going through. And he began teaching the synagogues and was praised, amen, by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he entered the synagogue on the same stood up to read and the, and the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Look what he's doing here. He is reinitiating, reinitiating his call and ministry. Amen. At this point, you have to perceive the remnant. Let me say, I'm going to use the word reinitiate. How would you spell that? Re, number seven. Amen. Reinitiate. Amen. His call, ministry, amen, hallelujah, does that make sense? Is reinitiating his call and ministry. So you say, why is that important? Because that's a key. He's saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why announce it? He has sent me. This is what I'm called to do. And he closed the book and gave it to the attendant. So I, I can tell you how, not how many times, I remember when I was a teenager and I'd go preach to the kids in high school. And sometimes the, you know, the teacher who was supposed to be the substitute teacher would, uh, one time we had a, uh, the teacher couldn't show up so they have to have what they call a sub teacher. But she necessarily wasn't teaching the class so they would turn it into a class where the kids could do homework, could do whatever they want. And I remember a couple of times like that the kids knew me because I was a leader of Student Christian Association and I was so bold in the school, you know, because I, was, I, was I wasn't one of those regular evangelists because I actually found out where the guys were doing the drugs, how they were doing it, and I knew everybody was doing everything. And I remember one time going to the bathroom, and I saw two guys doing a drug deal, and I was sitting in the toilet like this, and I looked through the gap, and I watched them. Suddenly jumped down, and I said, I got you. And they knew none of them wanted to fight me because I'd beat them all up before in primary school. So it wasn't like we had, you know, a fight problem. Like, they knew that if they kicked me, even when I was a Christian leader, like one guy, in high school, wanted to kick me one time. Well, he went to go punch me. Wrong thing to do. I kicked him. I beat him back. Hallelujah. And they was like, well, what kind of Christian is this? Hallelujah. I was one who kicks back. <laughs> At that time. But they knew that I would have messed up. So I told them, I said, listen to me, I'm going to bust you. And I'm going to tell them I know exactly where the drugs are. I know exactly what you're doing unless you come to my Bible study. And so, you know, they showed up. And they sat there. I never told them how they did their drug deal as long as they sat there and heard me preach for 30 minutes. <laughs> and you know the strategy worked because those two twin brothers ended up getting saved and became one of the main leaders of that whole organization that we were doing. They joined the organization and became one of the main leaders by the time I left that high school. So as much as my methods might not have been right, hallelujah, it still worked. Now what happened was... <laughs> You see, but what I used to do is sometimes when those substitute teachers weren't there and they'd want me to preach, I remember one time running back to the room where I had my notes in where I would do it and grabbing my notes and walking down the hallway, and I'd always say to myself, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach. And I was quoting that scripture the whole way, and I ran into this poll one time. Amen. Because <laughs> I was saying the verse that the Spirit of the Lord's upon me. He's anointed me to preach. <laughs> And then I finally got to that class, and I preached them supply of the Spirit. Basically drew a man on the board, explained what it means to get empowered by the Holy Spirit, explained that out of your belly, rivers of living water flow. And I'd actually take this little man, stick figure man I'd drawn, and I'd show rivers coming out of his belly. I mean, I was like 14 years old drawing pictures on the wall, trying to teach them about the Holy Spirit flowing out of your belly. That same message I preached when I was 14, now I'm 49, but that same message I preached, 
at 14 years old, became the book Supply of the Spirit. The notes from that message is in Supply of the Spirit's, what's it? That was at 14 years old, now it's 49. And so some of the books that we have were not something, they were birthed when I was a teenager. And they're finally a book now, hallelujah, or 10 years ago, or whatever. But reinitiate the call, amen, reinitiate the call, amen, of ministry. That means remind yourself, amen, the Spirit of the Lord, amen, who's with me, is on me, amen. Sometimes we forget we are anointed, amen. If you want, you've got to remind yourself, yes, I am anointed. Hallelujah. I'm going to write down the next thing. Look at verse 24. Verse 23. And he said to them, verse, 22, verse 23, and he said to them, no doubt you will quote the proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum. Do you hear in your hometown as well? And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. Amen. No prophet is welcome in his own hometown. Wow. Amen. Look at verse 22. They said it as well in verse 22. Go back to verse 22 for me. All were speaking well of him, wondering of the gracious words which were fallen from his lips, and they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? I want to say, I'm going to write this down, another one, very simple. But I want to write down number eight. Amen. Overcome familiarity. Amen. Who's with me? Overcome familiarity. Amen. Overcome familiarity. <laughs> Some people, I want to get into the power of God. Boy, Jesus had to overcome familiarity. He had to know how to deal with it. And still in the middle of all this family stuff, he, he couldn't do many mighty miracles there, but at least he healed some. Who's with me? Hallelujah. So he had to learn to get past, find a way to maneuver through familiarity. Those who know you, well, I know that pastor, I know he is, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes familiarity can be the biggest roadblock to you receiving a miracle. It can sometimes be the biggest roadblock to you getting a miracle or receiving what God has you. Because, well, I know that person. I, he's prayed for me before, nothing happened. Well, then you're likely to think in your head, if he prays for you again, nothing will happen again. Who's with me? Because you're putting yourself in a position of, I know them. I know their weaknesses. I know all about them. And that could be, the, I'm talking about just 12 keys to the doorway to power. Amen. Not, not complicated. Overcome familiarity. Amen. Hallelujah. Go with me a little further. Amen. Because look at verse 28. All the people in the synagogue... Amen. Verse 27. Um, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them was cleansed but Naam the Syrian. Jesus talks to the example about the wood, this woman. Go with me to verse 26 so I can see to you why they got mad. And Elijah yet was sent to none of them but to Zarephath, the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Now, you know why he was sent to this widow woman. Why wasn't he sent to any other widow woman? The Bible makes it very clear in 2 Kings 17, 8, that, that it says, and, and it says, 2 Kings 8, verse 1, and it says, and when you go to the verse and you, re and you read the scripture very carefully, it says, Elijah, uh, Jesus, um, God told Elijah, see, I've commanded a widow woman there to provide for you. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, Arise, go to the household, sojourn where you can sojourn, for the Lord has called for a famine, it will come to land. So Elisha spoke to the woman whose son, okay, no, that's not what I want. 2 Kings 17, amen. 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 8, and you'll see exactly the context of the verse. Basically, it says, Amen. 1 Kings 17, 8. We're mad. Okay, it's in the Bible. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> First Kings 17, 8, it's there. Hallelujah. And Elijah, then the word of the Lord came and saying, Go to Zarephath, belong to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to what? Provide for you. I don't understand, but maybe God has spoken to other widow women and they didn't hear. And this specific woman, widow woman, what? Heard. Who's with me? 
because he makes a distinction. Go back with me to Luke chapter 4. Amen. You want to look at this very carefully because I'm trying to help you to navigate to show you how to get past something. Amen. Into the power of God. Hallelujah. We've got to uh, see some of these things. Amen. So look at it. What did I say? And it says, only that woman. And there were many lepers in the time of Elisha the prophet, verse 27. None of them was cleansed, but only Nahum the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the... Isn't that amazing? You know? I don't understand why they got so mad. Hallelujah. But Jesus definitely had, had to go through a lot. Amen. Look at verse 30. But passing through the midst, he went away. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them in the, in the, on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teachings, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a spirit of unclean demon. And cried out in a loud voice, let us, look at verse 34, what? Let us alone. Are you ready? <laughs> Number 10, let me say demonstration. I think one of the things that keep you from standing in power is they don't step into the demonstration. Hallelujah. How can I say? There must be a demonstration of authority over unclean spirits. Demonstration of authority. Who's with me? Over unclean spirits. Now, I've dealt with homosexuals, lesbians, different people with unclean spirits. Some of them, when they got unclean spirits like that, when I've come towards them, they'll be like, I remember one person, I was getting ready to pray for them. I looked at them, I said, you foul spirits, you unclean spirits, you sexually dirty spirits. I was just looking at them, I said, I command you to come out. When I started holding my hand like one foot from them, the lady was going, ah, ah, you're hurting me, you're hurting me. Kayla has seen that happen, when, and, I, and the pastor standing there, I, I haven't even touched them. Who's with me? Now, I don't understand why the demon's saying I'm hurting them when I haven't even touched them. We've had that happen. My wife can tell you that several people were getting ready to pray for them to cast the demon out. And I haven't even laid hands on them. I got my hand like one foot from them. Or I go like this. And the lady says, he slapped me. He slapped me. But my hand was about a foot from them when I went like that. And I didn't even touch them. You know? And he's hurting me. He's hurting me. Or let me go. Or watch out when they do this kind of stuff. Because you are not hurting the person. The demon said this here very clearly, let us alone. Let's do our unclean business. Let's keep having our homosexual, lesbian relationships and doing whatever we want to do. Just don't mess with us. They want you to let us alone so bad, they want to have their own rights. Amen? But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And the amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another saying, What is this message? For with authority and power, he commands unclean spirits and they come out. The body of Christ has a great problem with this. Demonstrating authority of unclean spirits. We don't want to deal with it. Amen. With great authority and power, he commanded unclean spirits and they came out. And the report went about. Look at, carry on. Many are healed. Watch this. Amen. And they got up, left the synagogue, entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and left her. And immediately she got up and waited. And while the sun was setting, all those who had who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. Laying his hands on, the, on them, he healed them. Demons also were coming out of many shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak. Because they knew him to be the Christ. I like the way Jesus always silences them. Come out, be quiet. I'm not going to let you talk. And I, that's, I'm very, very leery over some of the things going on in Africa where they're allowing the demons to talk forever and putting it, all the conversations on TV. You know, I, they say they're doing this to explain to people how, exactly how the demon works. Now, I understand some of those things. You sit there and you go, yeah, yeah, the guy's doing this. But I think they can do it a whole lot faster. We have to be very careful to give glory to the devil, to try. Some of this stuff is trying to show the devil how great he is. 
No, we like, like yeah, I remember when Rodney wrote his book called This Present Glory because the other guy wrote This Present Darkness. And he wrote This Present Glory to counter This Present Darkness because it's very important. We need to focus on the greatness of God, the power of God, the goodness of God, and how powerful God is. We need to get a revelation of what it means to come into the demonstration with power. Amen? And so, um, these are, you'll see this. Now look at verse 5. Amen? Luke chapter 5 and verses 1. Now it happened the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God. He was standing by the lake and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake by fishermen. He gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out. Remember, he just met his mother, went to Peter's house, prayed for them. Who's with me? His mother-in-law was healed. The whole situation there. Amen. And Simon asked him to put out a little, and he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Hallelujah. Let down your nets for a catch. Amen. I love that. Simon said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When he had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so they began to sink. When Timon saw that he, had, he, this, that he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For amazement has seized him. And all his companions, because of the catch of fish which they had taken. I, I thought that was so amazing. I want to write down number, number 11. Call others to go with you. Amen. Number, where was that? Did I miss one? I missed, where was I? Number eight was overcome. Oh, number nine, I missed number nine, was redefine your future. Amen. Anyhow, it's okay. We can put it in there. We'll just change it. Number 10. I was putting number nine. This is number 10. I missed one. Number nine, I was going to talk about redefine, amen, your future. Amen. Number 10, number 11, number 11 was call others to go with you. Amen. Call others to go with you. Amen. Call others to go with you. He said, because Luke chapter 4, verse 28, and the, and the, it, it, the read thing is, is, I talked about that verse, Luke 4, 28, because it says they were raged and angry. And you'll see immediately after that what Jesus did, he get up and drove, and they drove him out of the city. What Jesus did was redefine. He was like, I'm not going to go there again. He just went to another place. Amen. So sometimes when people are opposing you, you have to learn to be able to redefine your future. Amen. If you don't know how to redefine your future, that means you're saying you're just allowing that to stay, 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 stay. He's not going to stay there in the crowd mad at him all the time. Who's with me? So there's no way Jesus is going to stay in the crowd mad at him. This is a key because why would I want to stay in the place where I can only do little miracles and then only heal a few of their minor ailments? Does that make sense? No. So he left and went to another city. Because a prophet is not welcome in his own sight. He had to redefine his future. Who's with me? He wasn't going to, you understand what I'm trying to say? So that was in there. Overcome familiarity, but redefine your future. That means you say, well, my family's not taking me. Don't waste your energy there. Redefine your future. Move forward. Amen. Hallelujah. Demonstrate the authority of unclean spirits. Call others to go with you. Amen. Call others to go with you. And I wrote down number 12. Demonstrate the, mul demonstrate the multiplication Look what Jesus did when you see that. And what happened was he demonstrated multiplication and increase for the future. He demonstrated multiplication and increase. One of the things he did to them is Jesus did something for the disciples over and over. Not only caused the fish to multiply, but this was the beginning of a demonstration. When he multiplies loaves and fishes and all these things, he's demonstrating, amen, who's with me, multiplication, amen, multi. Application, who's with me? And increase. So he didn't just tell his disciples, he demonstrated it. Who's with me? 
He demonstrated keys to multiplication increase to show them because I don't think they could just go where they're going to go. Amen. And he did this what? Until the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our God. Amen. So let me say this is a real symbol because I was looking at this and how this, and I thought this was real neat because the Bible always tells us that when Jesus was in his temptation, he always, one thing he always did was speak the word, speak the word, speak the word, speak the word. Amen. So let me say some of these again, 12 keys, a new baptism. You have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know this sounds real simple, but it is. You must come into the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you disciple, whatever you show, you got to lead people. Hey, listen to me. The Holy Spirit came upon me. Amen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit and power, went about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil. Acts 10, 44, while Peter preached, the Holy Spirit came on Cornelius' whole household. Okay, so they were what? Peter was preaching, and Cornelius' household got baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they went. They all spoke with tongues and magnified God. Be led by the Spirit. Face the enemy of your future. Right after you get filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? The devil is going to show, show up and say, oh, that tongue stuff is not working. I know you've been talking in tongues. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you say you're full of the Holy Spirit, and you can't even heal a mosquito's wing, broken wing, or something. Who's with me? You say you're full of the power of the Holy Spirit. I saw you pray for somebody and nothing's happening and blah, blah. You know, he's going to start. Who's with me? You've got to face the enemy of your future. Amen. You've got to overcome your temptations. Don't take any money with you. Don't take anything with you. Just go. Isn't that what Jesus told the disciples? So a lot of times I show up. I'll even go to Africa and they'll be like, didn't you, didn't you bring us dollars? No, I didn't bring you dollars. Many times I'll go to Africa. They'll be the minute I arrive in different places in Africa. They'll ask me if I brought them dollars. I said, nope, I didn't. Hallelujah. It's funny how everywhere you go, sometimes they want to know if you brought money. Or so <laughs> Overcome the temptation of material needs. Set God first. Overcome the temptation of dominion and glory. I'm not saying this. I'm not taking away from the fact that you have dominion and glory and authority in God. I'm talking about the fact that who's with me when it says overcome of you trying to say I have it all you know and before you know it they glorify the minister more than they glorify God hallelujah all Roberts always used to call that gold girls and glory amen hallelujah that's what he would call that you know gold girls glory he's saying yeah I got to get past those three temptations hallelujah trying to so manipulating time to benefit you Oh, the past is taking too long. This is taking too long. I got to speed this up. I got to position myself. Who's with me? I got to jockey for position. Whatever. Manipulating time to benefit you. This can imply many things, but it doesn't help people operate in power. Command the enemy to leave you. It's amazing how when, when we deal with temptation, I use a word called recognize, refuse, resist. Amen. We've got to learn to resist the devil. Amen. We've got to learn to, yeah, submit to God. Hallelujah. Reinitiate the call. Remind yourself the Spirit of God is pointing. This could be all, what I mean by that is I'm righteous, I'm sanctified, I'm redeemed, I'm anointed. Who's with me? The Spirit of God is upon me. I know the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Amen. Hallelujah. Reinitiate the call. This is very important. Overcome familiarity. Redefine your future. Demonstrate authority of unclean spirits. It's funny. If, if you can't get past the own sexual unclean spirits <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah you're free when the sun sets free it's free indeed you got it's like you almost got to be free to get somebody else free but you understand what i'm trying to say the principle because there's a of course you can do a certain amount of ministry because god's word does not return forth void there is a certain amount of praying you can do there is a certain amount of authority you can operate there is a certain amount of things you can do just because of the word's sake who's with me Many people do it because of the word's sake. The word is operating the mercy and goodness and grace of God, irrespective of the person not changing. So I understand that, but I'm talking about genuine power, coming into power. Amen? Call others to go with you. It's finished in how people, you, you know, we're, no one, the idea is yours. No one's going to do it by themselves. Amen? No one's going to do it by themselves. Hallelujah. I think Jesus made this very clear when he called others to go with him. Come follow me. Yeah, but what happens is, I love this because Jesus continually said, follow me, follow me, follow me. He called the disciples, amen? 
So we need to be in the place where we continually think about others, continually call others. Call others to go with you. You are not a lone ranger. Amen. Demonstrate multiplication and increase. Demonstrate multiplication. I'm, I just thought of 12 things that, that were related to just that Luke 3, 4, and 5. I saw 12 things in there. On In these 12 things, you see in the middle of all of this, in the middle of all this, Jesus is calling disciples to him. Uh, he goes to this guy, calls him. If you look at this in the chronological Bible, in the order of it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you'll see in the midst of all of this, he's calling people all the time. Uh, follow me. Comes to the, the table, who's with me? Or he goes here, or he, you know, they leave their boats and they follow him, who's with me? Or he's coming to Levi, Matthew, and he leaves his table and follows Jesus, who's with me? And goes to his house, hallelujah. He's doing this all the time. And the whole time, what's he trying to do to them? Empower them. Empower them. Show them how to be empowered. Amen. They know exactly what he went through. They know exactly what they're going to have to deal with. I think, I, I know it sounds strange, but if you're in a cave and you have 12 people hanging around you day and night, and sometimes you might be sleeping on the ground or sleeping in a cave or you're on the road, and they're traveling with you day and night for three and a half years, if there is familiarity, there is familiarity. Who's with me? I'm sure they knew when he got up in the morning. They knew when he went to the mountain to pray. They knew when he came back. They walked down the road there. I'm sure there was a lot of other conversations going on that's not written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because it said if all the things were written about what Jesus did and said, there would not be enough volumes in all the world to write all the words he said. The Bible tells us that. If all the things that were written of what Jesus said, it said there would not be enough books to contain. So he must have said a whole lot walking the disciples. He must have been talking all the time. Blah, 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 blah. For some reason, they didn't record it all. Who's with me? So you know that what, how, why would familiarity in this situation, familiarity with Jesus is familiarity with holiness. When it becomes dangerous, when a person becomes familiarity with the sin of the man of God, when they become familiarity with what is wrong with the man of God, that's when it becomes damaging. Amen? So today... You cannot be familiar with something that is perfect. When you follow a leader today, you're not going to have a perfect leader. I can do every, I can try, act like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus. I can try my best. Who's with me? But, I mean, who's with me? I'm not Jesus. Now, I know if somebody was familiar with Jesus, they'll, it's cool because they're familiar with perfection. They're familiar with holiness. They're familiar with all that. Who's with me? So, you understand what I'm trying to say, is this is, but this is a very powerful key, amen, that we understand that. We, we don't have a big circle, we've got a small circle here. And the smart, small circle must, must come into power, amen. And I saw this in Acts chapter nine, 19, let me just give one more verse and stop you, but Acts chapter 19, I thought, man, look at Paul, Acts chapter 19, he didn't have much. But I do know that this was major in Acts 19, when you go to verse 6, and it says, yeah, And Paul laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with tongues and prophesy. Twelve men got what? A new baptism. And they were all what? Twelve men in all. Can you see that? And they entered the synagogue and continue speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning, trying to persuade them about the kingdom of God. But when some of them became hardened and disobedient, keep going with me, Fur, disobedient, speak evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them. How do you like that? So I get these 12 people full of the Holy Ghost. I show up who's with me, trying to go into the regular church scene of the day, trying to go into their temple and talk to them about how great and how good God is and how they can get full of the Holy Ghost. They can speak in tongues. The Spirit of God can come them. They can get anointed. Who's with me? How God can change their lives. They, go, they don't like it. Who's with me? So the religious system of the day rejects them. So way before the people, he withdrew from them, took away the disciples. How do you like that? These are these, he got these 12 guys full of the Holy Ghost. He tried to go and talk to the regular folks in the city. The regular churches, who's with me, didn't work. So he took them, and they reasoned daily in the school of Tyrannius. 
And this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. How did all, huh? what? Call others to go with you. Demonstrate multiplication increase. All of Asia Minor, what? Heard the word of the Lord. How? Twelve men full of the Holy Spirit. How does David get discontented, debt, discouraged men and turn them into mighty warriors? I don't think it's any different between Jesus collecting his 12 and turning them into having the ability, who's with me, to demonstrate authority of unclean spirits, to call others to go with them, to demonstrate multiplication and increase, who's with me. I think he replicated. Before you know it, we have what? The day of Pentecost. What happened the day of Pentecost? They're going to repeat the same procedure again. A new baptism. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. There appeared to them divided tongues like as a fire, and they were all full with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word of God. Come on. With boldness, magnifying, glorifying God in that, right? Acts chapter 2. They were what? Empowered. Amen. What did they have to fade after that? They faced persecution. They were dispersed. Amen. Faced the enemy of their future. Before you know it, who's with me? Rome came against them. Everything came against them. Before you know it, we got zealots. We got even the religious people persecuting the church like Paul. Before he had a Damascus Road experience. And he had to get a new baptism who's with me come on isn't that right then they had to overcome their temptations whatever was going to the church you think all preachers are, are there's some greedy preachers there's some selfish preachers there's some good preachers there's hypocritical preachers there's overcome your temptation seek god first overcome the temptation of dominion glory Mani- overcome the temptation to manipulate time to benefit you command the enemy to leave you Reinitiate the call of God. Overcome familiarity. Redefine. Dem- I'm telling you, I'm just giving you some simple things that you'll see almost in a consistent cycle within that small circle, as if we were hiding in a cave right now. We say, What are we going to do? Amen. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I think you get it. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Come on. God is good, amen.